G'day guys, Will here, welcome back to the channel. So today's video, we are up to installing our hard lines and of course our graphics card as well into the ultimate gaming and sim racing PC. So this is one of the more time consuming and tedious tasks and truth be told, I stayed up very, very late again last night experimenting with various different layout ideas and stuff. And I've actually made a few changes to the layout in the bottom of the case that I'll show you in just a moment. But basically, I wanted to fiddle around and figure out exactly what was gonna sort of provide, I guess, the most efficient way to lay out the loop as well as something that would look really cool as well. Uh, and I played around with a bunch of different ideas. Uh, look, I'm not the most creative person in the world when it comes to these sorts of things. So things that take me hours and hours and hours will probably take some of you guys five minutes to sort of just look at and go, yep, yeah, this is what I want it to look like. But for me, I like to really take the time and make sure that I'm going to be absolutely happy with exactly how we lay things out. So what we'll be doing in today's video is obviously getting the graphics card back inside the system, showing you how I've got things laid out and the changes that I've made since the last video. And then we'll get to work actually bending all of our hard lines. I'll show you how to do all that show you how to get everything installed as well. Now I do actually have another hardline tutorial video that I did about a year and a half ago now, but I'm gonna go into a lot of detail again in this video as well, obviously because we're now in a studio, the production quality is a lot better, and there's probably a couple of things that I can improve on that previous video as well. So there'll be lots of detail in this video on exactly how to bend the lines, all the equipment that you need to do so, uh, how to actually fit them into the compression fittings, all that kind of thing. So we're gonna cover it in as much detail. I'll also explain how I do a dry leak test as well before I start filling with liquid. So that is what you can look forward to in today's video. Okay, so as I mentioned in the previous video, the graphics card is a very, very tight fit inside the case. It basically sits with the Aorus logo here right up against these mounting brackets. Not quite touching, but there's probably less than a millimeter of clearance in there, but that's how I like to do things. I like to keep it as close as possible. So the graphics card itself is sitting inside a Cooler Master vertical GPU bracket, which is exactly the same one I used in the previous build. And basically we've got a riser cable here, which plugs into our PCI Express slot there and then the mounting bracket goes into place. Pretty self-explanatory stuff there. So we want to start off by plugging in our riser cable. It's a little bit awkward to sort of get all this in place, but we plug that into the slot, make sure it's clicked in. See, there's a little bit of condensation inside the card from when I flushed it out after being in the previous system. It's a shame. I kind of wanted to have a completely virgin card to go with all the other virgin components, but um, obviously I didn't want to have a 2080 Ti sitting on the shelf not being used for the last sort of four or five weeks while I was getting all the other bits and pieces together for the build. So that sits there nicely like that. You can see, like I said, that's right up against the edge there. Now, one thing that I did notice is with the with the motherboard installed, this bracket actually kind of braces against the back corner of the motherboard here. So it actually provides a bit more rigidity than I originally thought there would be. Remember I told you in the review video that I did of this case that there was quite a lot of flex in this bracket. That seems to have been resolved for the most part by the fact that it sort of rests up against the back plate of the motherboard. So hopefully we're not gonna have any issues there, but it does seem to sit pretty solidly without too many dramas at all. So we'll feed our RGB cable around the back as well and get that all plugged in. So originally I had the outlet of the pump facing this direction with a Y splitter installed for my drain and my outlet. And that basically gave me an open port on the radiator here on both sides, which I was then gonna have to plumb in and run extra tubes things like that. So I decided that that was adding a lot of unnecessary clutter in terms of extra pipe work to plumb in that additional radiator. So what I did was I rotated the pump 180 degrees here. So the outlet is now on the back side. And then I used three 90 degree angled fittings from EK to plumb that directly into the radiator. There's not too much tension there or anything like that. It actually fits in really nicely. So then we've got a plumb directly into our radiator. Another one coming straight out of the radiator and that will become our outlet up into the graphics card. Okay, 
so we're now up to perhaps the most challenging part of the build that is bending all the piping getting it all installed getting it all looking pretty and laid out efficiently and all those things so there's a couple of things that i want you guys to understand before we start bending these tubes and i'm going to show you how we do all of that all the equipment that you need in just a moment but first of all i wanted just to quickly explain to you guys that the order in which you lay out the components in the in the loop isn't important now I know a lot of people probably wonder why that is. Now, the reason is that the amount of water that's passing past each individual component inside the system is actually really high, really fast. And the surface area or the contact area is very, very short duration, a very small area. So, for example, if you're pumping water past the GPU or past the CPU, it only actually has the opportunity to pick up a little bit of heat at a time. It's not, if you know, if your CPU is running at 80 degrees, the water that's coming out of the back of the CPU block isn't gonna be 80 degrees when it comes out. In fact, it's only actually a couple of degrees over at absolute most the general temperature of the body of water throughout the system. So if you measure the temperature, I've actually done this in previous videos. If you measure the temperature of the water that's inside your reservoir, usually it's within about half a degree to two degrees maximum difference between what's coming out of each of the components that are introducing heat into the system. So for that reason, basically all that matters is that your cooling capacity is greater than the amount of heat that's being generated by the system. So you wanna make sure that your radiators are large enough and your fans are powerful enough and everything that you're bleeding away more heat or dispersing more heat into the atmosphere than what's being generated by the system. As long as you've achieved that, then you're not gonna have any problems with runaway temperatures. Now, the only thing that does matter is of course that your pump is immediately after the reservoir and that the pump sits at the lowest point in the case and the reservoir sort of sits at the highest point possible. And the only reason that that's important is because it makes filling and draining and bleeding air a lot more easy. Once the, once the loop is actually established and the water's circulating, it really doesn't matter. Often what you'll find is when you're bleeding a system that's got really massive uphill runs, you know, loops in it and things like that, it can be really hard to get that air pushing out to begin with and get the water flowing. But once it's flowing, the pump is working the same pretty much regardless of what it's doing. So I wanted you guys to understand that before we start bending the lines here. But um, next, I think it's probably best if we have a look at the equipment that we're actually gonna be using to do this. Now, you don't need to have all of this equipment, but it certainly makes things a little bit easier. So I like to use the Thermaltake Pacific Hard Tube Bending Kit. Obviously, you wanna make sure you get the one that matches the inner and outer diameter of the pipes that you're working with. I'm working with 12 millimeter inner diameter and 16 mil outer diameter. So that is the kit that I use, and there is a link in the description below if you wanna pick one of those up. So this kit comes with a wonderful pipe cutting tool, which you'll see how that works a little bit later on. Basically, you put the pipe in, wind it down, and you spin it around, and it cuts a nice straight edge on the pipe. It also comes with an assortment of different bending tools as well. You can actually bolt these down to a plank of wood or something like that if you want to, but I just kind of use them freehand. So we've got a 180 degree, a 90 degree, 135 degree, and a 360 degree loop as well. So that makes bending the tubes consistently a lot easier. And I, I can't remember exactly how much it costs now off the top of my head, but it was definitely well worth the money. Now it also comes with this little chamfering tool as well, which is really useful for beveling the edges or chamfering the edges of your pipes. And that basically just reduces the risk of tearing an O-ring or something like that when you're pushing the pipe into the compression fitting. So really important to have that as well. We've got a piece of 1200 grit sandpaper and we use that to polish up and round off the edges of those chamfered edges because this does tend to leave a few burrs and things like that. So we like to just tidy it up with some sandpaper. We've got a tube of silicon here as well that comes in the kit and that is to actually feed through the pipes when you're bending them and that stops the pipes from collapsing on themselves. So that's really important. So we'll leave that there as well. And we also have a little bowl of soapy water here as well. So it's basically just dishwashing liquid mixed in with some water. And basically we just want to lubricate the um, both the pipe when we're bending the tubes as well as lubricate the ends when we're inserting them into the compression fittings. So that is pretty much it. We've also got our heat gun as well, obviously, which we're going to be using to bend the tubes themselves. So let's get started on doing some tube bending.
right, so pretty happy with how that's turned out. Very, very, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Extreme, I guess, would be one word to describe it, but I've tried to sort of keep everything relatively sort of symmetrical and not overly convoluted. I've seen a lot of builds in this case where there's weird angles kind of going all over the place. And I want to sort of try to keep it all to 90 degree angles apart from this one little kink down here. So yeah, pretty happy with it. So the only thing left to do now before we fill it up is to do our dry leak test. So the way I do that is a little bit kind of crude, but it definitely works. It worked for the previous build I did anyway. So what I like to do is I plug up the fill port at the top there so the system is completely sealed. And I take my filler syringe and I stuff it into the tube. So I squish it in like that. And then what I do is I pump some air in, just like that, pump the air in, shut the valve, and then take it off again, and do one more pump as well, just for good measure. So I open the valve, pump the air in, close the valve, now I'm going to show you quickly now, we'll, we'll test it together and see whether it's leaking or not. But what should happen is when I open the valve, we should hear a little puff of air come out of this pipe. So what I like to do is I leave it overnight and if it still has air pressure in the morning, then I know that I'm good to start filling with liquid because obviously if it can hold air, it can definitely hold liquid. So we'll open it up here and we'll have a listen together. Ready? There it is. Uh, hopefully you guys heard that. So it's definitely holding at least a little bit of air pressure. Now we don't want to pump it up massively. We don't need to use pressure gauges or anything like that. I think, you know, a lot of people do do that. I've never really felt the need. I think as long as it holds a little bit of air pressure like that, we should be good to go. So I'm going to pump it full of air again now, leave it overnight and then all being good overnight, tomorrow morning we can fill it up with the coolant and do a proper leak test. So guys, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you've learned a thing or two from this video. That is at least my technique for bending lines. It's always worked well for me and I've never had a single leak or any problems touch wood. So if you wanna pick up any of the gear that you've seen in this video, you can use the affiliate links in the description below to do that. But uh, above all, thanks guys very much for watching. Hit the thumbs up button if you've enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell as well so you don't miss the next video. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Bye.